I'm Penny Wilson and I teach Egyptian archaeology in the Department of Archaeology at Durham. The thing that's always fascinated me about Egypt is the way in which the perception that we have of it never seems quite to match the archaeology and the actual material when you're in Egypt working on an excavation for example. So we very much have an image of Egypt as a place with these big temples, big tombs, very deserty, full of sand. Yet when I go to Egypt, I seem to find lots of mud, lots of water and lots of green fields. And I think in my work, I've increasingly tried to work out how those two extremes come together to produce the Egyptian civilization. So I think what I've found is that the emphasis on those big tombs and temples is absolutely fascinating. But what's even more fascinating is seeing how life in Egypt actually went ahead in order to produce those kind of monuments. So I'm looking at the at Egypt from the bottom up and I think that's where my main interest lies. Uh, many years ago in order to try to understand the, uh, the buried Egypt, the Egypt under all the sediment and the mud, I discovered that if you take a uh, drill auger and stick it in the ground you can pull up lots of mud and you can see bits of the past in that mud then if you take each of the drill augers and put them together, you can begin to create a map of larger areas in order to understand what's actually buried underneath the ground. It's a bit like taking apple corer and putting it into an apple and pulling it out and you, you have a, a part of the inside of that apple. So for Egypt, using these drill cores, we can produce, put lots of these cores together in order to produce a, an image of what lies buried underneath. Sometimes it's a bit like putting a needle in a haystack, but other times you can be incredibly lucky in what you can pick up uh, in your drill cores. Most of my work that I do in Egypt is based in the north of Egypt, in the delta, which is a large expanse of agricultural land basically. And so here it's a very good opportunity to use drill coring in order to get at the buried sediments underneath and to see how they've built up over time. So Egypt has a very long history going back 5,000 years at least. And in order to do that, using drill coring at Sias, for example, we've been able to pick up Neolithic material buried in the floodplain from about 4000 BC. That's really the only way that you can actually get at some of these buried levels, because it's impossible to excavate to depths of four, five, six metres without using expensive dewatering equipment. Drill coring provides an easy, quick, simple al alternative in order to get the information that you want very fast. At Sias, we've been able to reconstruct the old landscape, if you like, so where the original river channels went, how they changed in their channels, and the impact that that had on human settlement at the site. And because our site has material from the Neolithic period, from about 4000 BC, we can track that right through to the modern day and to the modern village that still exists on the site. So we actually have tiny strata from almost 6,000 years, which is an incredibly long period of time. So then that makes you ask the question, why do people live here in the first place? What is there so attractive about this particular spot for settlement? And then how does it relate to other settlements and can we find them in the immediate area around Sias? Over this long period of time it's possible to see patterns of change, um, so in where settlements are placed, or things dictated by political and cultural developments, but it's also possible to see continuities. Um, just in a very uh, a simple example, people reuse materials all the time because the delta isn't very, uh, doesn't have access to quarries and stone, um, so people there tend to use stone all the time, again and again. So something that you could find the, uh, in its final deposit as a door jamb or part of a door uh, fitting, uh, perhaps originally could have part been part of a statue or part of uh, a grave uh, fittings. Um, and trying to understand how people then thought about those stones. Were they just being pragmatic and using them from an economic point of view? Or did they actually understand that they came from something older, so they realised that they were part of a, a longer continuum? That's one of the interesting questions about the material. Since I've been at Durham, we've taken students on excavation in Egypt or on survey projects uh, in order to train up them up uh, in the type of methodology that's used in Egypt and in order to uh, introduce them to the particular culture of Egypt as well. So students who perhaps worked in Western archaeology coming to Egypt, it's kind of a very different situation to working in, say, Roman Britain or in, uh, in, in France, for example. However, there are some um, similarities, uh, particularly in the methods that we use. So applying sort of uh, those methods to ancient Egyptian questions is one of the things that's useful for students, I think, to understand. 
Um, and so students have become on excavation and on survey work and we've also done some experimental archaeology back in Durham, uh, making and breaking objects for example that we obviously couldn't do um, with real things and also working in the museum at Durham, in the Oriental Museum, we've been able to perhaps link the objects there to the kind of things that we find in the field, because the museum has the whole things, whereas we find the fragmentary things in the field. So all of these things are, are very useful for, um, I think, helping students to understand the kind of material culture that they're looking at. At the moment, uh, my research has completely changed its focus, partly because of the political situation in Egypt. Because things have changed in Egypt in the last three years, I'm finding that this is making me reevaluate my research goals and my research aims. And that's quite an exciting thing, but it's also quite a daunting thing, because I think things that you hold dear uh, are not possible anymore no. and some things that you never really appreciated that perhaps were extremely valuable are now coming to the fore as being in incredibly useful and important. So my research is now more focused I think on trying to build a sense of Egyptian heritage on from the ground up. So in the village that we work in we're trying to engage our community more with what we do. Not in the sense that they do it, but just that they appreciate what we actually do. And I know that sounds like something that you might take for West, in the, for granted in the West, or working mm. in Durham. But for in Egypt, it's something, it's something quite new, something different. And I think this is this has come slightly out of the revolution in Egypt, but also it's making us reevaluate what we're doing there in the first place. It's the issue of taking for granted that as a foreigner you come in and you do work in Egypt and you go home and you publish a report and that's it. Mm. The, the difference is you come in, you want to engage with the people with whom you meet and tell, explain to them what you're doing and why you're there. It's so that in, in the future maybe we don't have to be there. Maybe we can be the ones looking at reports and reading them from the comfort of our offices. Mm and in the future it will be Egyptians who are providing the reports and the backbone work for us.